make a quick review of what we did last time about uh, causality in the case of the spin uh, tensorial particles. Okay. So for any spin which is integral, we found out that we can easily define uh, for the regular vex W, uh, we can define this modular operator called SW. And this SW is anti linear. This involution square is one. And there's a property that you take an element of the wide algebra. So using this SW, Oh. Uh, using this uh, SW, we can define a real subspace for the Hilbert space. Okay, or the Hilbert space, or the giant Hilbert space where everything is operating, we can define a real subspace, namely those vectors that are clearly by SH yes, by this modular operator. And then using that, we can define a while algebra. Whose elements I call used to call W, but for some reason the notation has shifted to V. So it's a while algebra, and it has a property that acting on the backbone, and I apply SW, goes into VH, the emission coefficient of VH acting on E0. Okay, so this is a new property of the model of this. Then it is very quick uh, to prove. So the spin and statistics for integral spin particles. Uh, let me give you an example. So take two operators, A, B, and they take the vacuum and uh, uh, and A, uh, let me see what happens. So I, what is it? Yeah, so that's not what I tried to do here. I want to show now that because of this relation, Expectation value of any two operators in the vacuum is a thermal state. Okay. This is what I wanted to prove. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I didn't prove I'm not feeding again, but I wanted to prove that these are all thermal states. Yeah. So, I have a view of H plus boundary. Expecting boundary. View of H star. And it is going to be the view of H star will be unknown. So, unknown at all. Uh, the spectrum just uh, the spectrum yeah, surely VMS is a unitary operator so there is no problem there you are asking about the generators of VMS yes. so I guess that uh, it is I have to define what is going to be adjoined and what it does to the algebra elements we are so on, uh, on the VH yeah. but VH itself is unitary so V of H star and V of minus H is unit. These are unitary operators. So in this whole game, one likes to avoid unbounded operators with field operators. So at the moment you write field operators. Um, with a, um, when a model is interest in uh, precision, you are getting more about domain problems. Okay? Immediately you get into domain problems. So, uh, we have this VFX start uh, adjoint operator. It goes into the adjoint, you can write. Then you have to be sure that both the operators have vacuum in the domain. Then you cannot multiply them, two operators. They, or if you start multiplying them, you will get you can get into problems like the commutator of X and P being zero, being IH bar, which uh, doesn't make much sense if you, you, you take traces. So why is it going wrong when you have to go on and, uh, why, uh, and chase on what has gone wrong? Okay. So, so I am only dealing with unitary operators. And a uh, little later, we will see that many of these statements I am making change for spinorial systems, spinorial systems in a rather surprising way. You will find that the causality implies that. The note I sent on, I told you what happens. What happens that the reason is that the square in the CPT operator for tensorial particles is plus one acts as identity, but for spinorial particles, it is minus one. This sign change 
is quite profound and it has all it affects all the succeeding calculations for we will come to that in a minute. Okay. So I want to simply show that this is a time mistake. So I take the expectation value A and B and notice that because A and B by the meaning of some uh, adjoint, this is A star on A0 times B on A0. But this is the same as the, this because of this relation and because SW is JW, which is your modular evolution, then square root of delta W, acting on A of B0. Likewise, here, but J is anti unitary. So I pull it out, but I have to reverse the factors which I have done here. Then, uh, again, I put first delta W on the left, or bring it out, take simple delta W. Then this side I will not let it be. So this expression here is equal to this. Which is this. And because we see what we see in the delta W, we find that this also equal to this. The so delta W is exponential, is exponential minus beta k. In your thermal rotation, the delta W is exponential minus beta k. So you see from here that this is a k. This expectation I do fulfills the KMS property. So the state I'm writing here is a KMS state. Okay. This is a thermal state. It's not pure. This is a thermal state. If you are, uh, yeah, there's all the properties of a thermal state, and you can start discussing it. What is beta? Huh? What is beta? Beta will not be determined by the model, and that uh, that is not intrinsically determined. What what is intrinsically determined is the one by one group generated by the boost operator. The normalization is not determined. So the boost operator has a dimension. Lorentz is a Lorentz transformation, so it is dimension less. So if you want to write the exponential i t k plays good, t has a dimension. So in front of it, you have to put some beta, some temperature, some scale factor, and that is determined by other considerations. It should not give you t. You will not get it here. Okay. It's up to you. So the scale must take the one temperature. KMS state is not defined for the state temperature. It is defined like this. That's it. But delta W is a, what is it? A modular operator. So it's show up is exponential minus pi k. K is your modular Hamiltonian. So if you like exponential minus pi h, h is your Hamiltonian. Dimension, yeah, you can write like that. Exponential minus pi h. So but you can also put the scale there. Scale. Let me say this. What I'm sure. One cannot determine the scale. Overall scale of time. Just, so the overall scale of time is not fixed by this. But you can determine the direction of time. By in what direction is entropy increasing. That can be done. But you cannot determine the scale. And which I will not ask to do. If you look at it dimensionally, you find can find out what there is. Hmm? This is the definition. This is the definition of the chemistry. Uh, but then, uh, like, but like, you have to find the notion of strip. And side of the strip, what gives you I don't want to, I want to go back. I did to wrote down. Yeah. What is KMS state? I have not found it. Call it No, I am looking at the definition of KMS state, which I gave somewhere. Yeah, this is the KMS state. So if you are, this is the definition. If you have density matrix rho, the KMS state fulfills this. So you have the state 
omega the claim is that omega is characterized by density matrix rho so omega rho omega b a and b is equal to omega rho e exponential by theta a so the comes first Uh, if you take rho to be exponential minus beta h, it comes if you take it by and h is a Hamiltonian and b is a time evolution in the imaginary direction, it gives you beta. Okay? But what you are getting here is beta times h. Okay? The whole operator, how you split it is up to you. Okay? You can call the time evolution operator as the expand, scale beta prime. Then you get beta prime here, but the time evolution is been got by h prime, and that's also an equivalent KMS scale because that's simply scaling the Hamiltonian and scaling the Fermi. So that's also good the standard exponential minus beta h. So you're scaling the temperature and the Hamiltonian as well. There's no intrinsic definition of Hamiltonian in this game. K can be scaled. So if you scale it, you also have to scale the temperature. So that cannot be fixed. Intrinsically, you can fix it by other considerations. Uh, if you're doing, uh, say, constantly accelerated particles, then that will use, you can use that to put a scale, okay? but not here. Okay. okay. So I want to know, okay, So, so what I have proved now is that beta no beta you essentially scale. I don't know the answer. It, no, no, it will diverge. The problem is the following. No, this can go to zero. X can go to zero. No, it's given to you. No, can't change H. Here. No, I'm scaling both H and beta. That's okay. The spectrum of H, which is the boost operator, is unbounded below and above. So if you scale H, the spectrum will not change because it's going all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity and including zero as Krishna likes to go on emphasizing. It is not that the spectrum is, let me remind you of the definition of a spectrum. You are not trying to diagonalize operators. Okay? But what you are doing is looking at the resolver. You take k minus a complex variable z, okay? k minus z, and ask when does, there, when does an operator k prime exist for which it is, if you multiply by k prime, you get one. Okay? Then you think of k prime as an inverse. Okay? But k prime is not computed, it's just this equation k minus z times k prime is the identity operator. Whenever that defines for you such a subset of the complex plane, the complement of the subset is what is called the spectrum. Okay. Normally, it will be the eigenvalue in finite dimensions. In three dimensions, no. It can get very complicated, and it does get very complicated here. And uh, as what Krishna was emphasizing, and it's a fact that for the algebra we are getting, the zero is in the spectrum of this operator. So, you can't remove, if you scale it, you can still have a zero in the spectrum, you go all the way to infinity on one way and the other way and don't change anything. So I don't know what will happen if you take the limit. I don't know what will happen. Okay. Uh, there may be some, I don't know, maybe correlation functions have a limit. That I don't know. In beta. That I don't know. Okay. But you don't have much freedom in changing k. It's uh, when scaling doesn't change its properties. So, uh, but we should notice that this KMS property is there for every W. Okay. So, uh, okay. Now, you may want to, uh, I want to remind, you know, the following property, of it, I'll say one more, I'll remind you, if you like, one more property of this. 
Lorenz in geometry, so properties of Lorenz in geometry is the take the real language W and you take the, for example, another real language which I call, say, for example, W1, which is just knows here, say, W1 is a real language starting here and going this way. W2 is a real language going that way. And you intersect the two things, you get this diamond. This diamond is also a Hawking complete region, and you can repeat the entire analysis using this index. And you can characterize the vectors in the Hilbert space, the real vectors in the Hilbert space, by taking real functions supported here, defining Fourier transforms in an appropriate way. I will not discuss how the appropriate way is. And Finding out the functions in momentous space, which will define for you the real surface corresponding to this. But these subspaces are different. Okay? The subspaces for H1 for W1 and H2 for W2 are different. Okay? And it is a fact that if you take the real subspace of W1 intersection in W2, it's the same as taking the intersection. So the full Hilbert space is this one plus I times. Same thing that finds the full Hilbert space, but most interesting thing is that the uh, say, this subset I don't I have not written it yet is actually the intersection of the subspace for W1 intersecting with the uh, real subspace for H1 times intersection with real subspace for W2. Okay. So you can go on intersecting the subspaces on the Hilbert space, and you will get the subspace for the fossil diamond also. Okay. Um, And they all have the property that they fill up the whole thing. What I mean, but take the subspace and they tell some with I type that subspace, you get the full Hilbert space. Uh, so, you know, so what you have done, you can go on doing this. There is a theorem that if this way, by intersecting this, the regular wedges, you will generate all possible localizable regions and they will generate the full Minkowski space. With this, uh, this diamonds populating all over the place in four dimensions. Actually, probably not many dimensions. Each of these surfaces have their own Tomita operators. Each of them they have their own uh, modular operators, say what their own case. So they, their own one parameter subgroups, exponential ITK for each of them. And this K. Yeah. And, and this K, all of them annihilate the vacuum. Okay. So you have an infinite, infinite number of localized one parameter groups annihilating the vacuum. We are part that anything, any unitary group annihilating the vacuum is a symmetry. But what is this symmetry? Okay. It is some infinite dimensional symmetry which looks localized in each costly complete region. So what is it? Okay. It has no analog in Lagrangian free theory that I know. And one does not know what it is here either. One would like to know, but does not know what it is. But one knows it, it exists. Okay? So this is very strange, and I, I, one would like to know what it is. But as of now, no information is available. Okay? Hmm? So we have exponential k, exponential i t k w for any w. Acting on the vacuum is one. Okay. This is no. Okay. By construction of the Tomita operators, this is no. Okay. So, but, but KW are different from different Ws. Okay. No. Because the domain of these operators, they all will look no. The domain of these operators. These are all unbounded operators, and they are all defined. They have a dominant definition. It cannot be defined on all the entire Hilbert space. So the real subspaces where they are defined is changing from edge to edge. They are different. It could happen that two of the wedges don't intersect. Then the corresponding domains are disjoint. 
thing. So you can uh, if one cannot apply the operator for one domain on the other one. You'll get you'll get undefined objects. Okay. So it is not correct. So one should really write this case index by w, which will give you the domain. Okay. And the domains are all different. So one cannot do that. So, but the, are the domains different or are they disjoint? Because if they are disjoint, then one can define a bigger operator by extending the domain, by taking the union of the domains. So, so can you interpret? I don't deal with this. So, uh, uh, but I suppose the domains are not disjoint because we if the, disjoint, yeah, the domains are not disjoint. What I know, he said the. Uh, the domain, the k corresponding to the intersection of the domains okay, uh, is acting, can act on the real surface, which is obtained by intersecting on the real surface of the two regions. So, in that case, one can get rid of the domain problem by restricting the domain to say some subdomain. Okay. But in general, you can't do this. Okay. So, you are, uh, the question is being posed, okay, but this is the situation. Uh, what happens if you have two different domains to these operators? I don't know. No, but if the domains if the domains were completely disjoint, then one could have defined a, a global operator by just taking the union of the domains. But since they are not since they are not disjoint, so no. you really have different union operators. Two domains is not a domain. No, that's not correct. Yes. If I take the union of two domains of an unbounded operator, that is not a domain for the operator. No, you can you can define a new operator. That's what I'm saying. You can define a new operator by extending the domain, but but it's not union, so so you can do it. It's not disjoint, so you can do it. Let me tell you. What, okay. So this is a problem which came up in. Uh, okay, I don't know where I have. So it's a little bit off. I don't know how many of you had some basic grounding. I know that. Kuindrajan has said some domain, uh, has worked on domain issues. Take the following simple problem. Okay? Take a particle on a circle. Okay? So you have a particle on the circle, and the domain of the operator is characterized by wave. So a densely defined domain is characterized by wave functions, which are quasi periodic. That is, when you go around the circle, it changes by a phase, which I call exponential i theta. Okay? So the domain D, so the momentum, the, the operator which I am dealing with, let me call it D of theta, has a domain which I call D of theta. Okay. Now, you can take P of theta 1 and P of theta 2. Uh, what is the domain for P of theta 1 and P of theta 2 together? You are suggesting take the union of D of theta 1 and D of theta 2. Theta, the two, union of the two domains and act, act with that. Unfortunately, this does not work. So what it is, uh, this issue was, I think, discussed in some detail by the group of Bebe Marmo, Paolo Faki, and uh, uh, and um, uh, Albert Ibot. Uh, they have a paper and followed, followed up by Paolo. And what they have to do is something which is not very familiar to many, many people. You have to take, uh, so, the domains of these operators are always characterized by some unitaries, uh, some uh, by von Neumann theorem. It is characterized by some unitaries u, okay? only some Hilbert space. Okay? So, so you can take the Cayley transform of this u. So your theta for one, your theta one for one, your theta two for another. You take the Cayley transform, which makes some simple joint operators. One plus i u theta one. Uh, Divided by 1 minus i u theta 1, maybe with i in front is a semi joint operator. And what you have to do is to take this set, the semi joint operators and will have a, a quadratic forms and they have to pull this theory of quadratic forms, which is uh, you, the uh, domain of the quadratic forms are usually much larger. So you extend both these operators using quadratic forms, then add the domains okay, at the level of the quadratic forms. Then you do a numerous KD transform. When you do that, you get some product they call u theta 1 star u theta 2, which is it is not anything, it's not anything like what you started. Okay. You can write it down. It's, it's a 
it is associated product among the unitaries, changes the domain, but the, that the domain you get is not the domain by you taking union of U of theta one and U of theta. No, I, I was saying something different, but anyway, let's move on. I was saying something completely different. So, anyway. Okay, uh, let me, it's so, okay. You cannot take, you take, you have an operator, uh, two, uh, with, you have an operator with the domain D1 and the domain D2. So there, there are actually two operators, uh, T1 and P2 for domains. Then, uh, if you want to define an operator in D1 union D2, it is not P, the original symbol P, using this domain. It will not be yeah, I mean, you can you can take the direct sum of the operators if the domains are disjoint, because that's just the direct sum. Uh, but not, that no. won't work here. By linearity, the P1 will act on D2 and P2 will act on D1, and you will get undefined objects. So it's a linear system. It is not disjoint action. Unless you yeah. this. It's given cross 1 and 1 cross P2. That's then you are taking change the limit right? that you can do, but that is not this exit in the domain. So yeah. we can have sessions on this. It's a very interesting problem. Somehow related to some problem that Goindra is interested in quantum politics, but it is uh, we can discuss it. The kind of things that happen are quite strange. So we can discuss that also. Okay. okay. So, uh, I, uh, given a, uh, uh, what is it, geometrical analysis of, of a net. So, what you are doing is start with the little bits, okay, for which you know the Tobita operator. Uh, take another little bit, there are infinite number of little bits. Okay. Then, if you take any region, which I call causality complete, which is a, is, Take all the real images which contain that causally complete region. Yeah. If you take a causally complete region, that means that the double parameter causally of O is uh, O itself. And the real part of HO, you can do the. So, this object O is intersection of real images. What are these real images? Take every W which contains O and take the intersection. It is guaranteed that you will get back W O. So, so what is a real part of H for this O? You take the real part of each of these HW and take the intersection. Then you get what is a set kind size here. Having known that, I can write the SW, which is SW will be immediate, it's like the size of your objects, and this plus I times is anti linear. Side the head, you change the when you take the direct sum of this is i times that one, it will change the i to minus i. It has all the right properties. Can you write can you write this object this chain? I don't know how. It has a polar decomposition, you can keep going. So uh, what you have got here is an enormous structure. Okay? Namely, it is a structure where, where you are populating space time with little diamonds or a lot of wedges, each of which has, has its own local algebras, each of which has, has, own, has its own model operators, and uh, they all define observables locally, which are all KM states, and somehow generate an infinite-dimensional symmetry algebra, for which we are, we have no trace of it in the canonical formulation of quantum theory. So that is the situation we are Finding ourselves in yes. okay. particular diamond can insert another bigger diamond. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. That is no problem. Okay. So you yeah. that one is okay. you take a smaller diamond, I can do the same construction for the small diamond. Take all uh, little edges containing the smaller diamond oh, know, and take intersection. But there is another axiom uh, called isolated name check told you that if you have your situation. The algebra in the smaller diamond called O O1 okay, is contained in the algebra in the bigger diamond. Okay. So you know what uh, uh, there's an ascent to so the algebra inside is contained in the algebra in the bigger one. Now you can ask 
ಆದ್ರೆ ತೊಮಿಚಾ ಕ್ವಾಂಟಮ್ ಫೀಲ್ ಥಿಯರಿ ಆಲ್ಜಿಬ್ರಸ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಡೀಲಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ನೋ ಇನ್ವೇರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ಜಿಬ್ರಸ್ ಆರ್ ಎನಿ ಕೆನಾನಿಕಲ್ ಟೈಪ್ ದಟ್ ಐ ನೋ ದೇ ಆರ್ ವೆರಿ ಬ್ಯಾಡ್ ಇನ್ ಮ್ಯಾಥಮೆಟಿಕಲ್ ಟರ್ಮ್ಸ್ ಒನ್ ಟ್ರೀಸ್ ದಮ್ ಲೈಕ್ಲಿ ಬಟ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ವೆರಿ ಬ್ಯಾಡ್ ದೇ ಗಿವ್ ಆಲ್ ಕೈಂಡ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಕೇರ್ಲೆಸ್ ಸೊ ನೋ ದಟ್ಸ್ ದ ಕೇಸ್ ಬಟ್ ವೆದರ್ ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ಕಮ್ ಸಬ್ ಆಲ್ಜಿಬ್ರ ವಿತ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇನ್ವೇರಿಯನ್ ಐ ಡೋಂಟ್ ನೋ ಸಾರಿ ಯಾ then me i have not heard of such thing there are things will come to that maybe yeah. see there are some algebras they play a very important role algebra and some in uh, the kind of thing that you was were doing with ramesh kohl and rama devi is doing on uh, in very so not in non theory there is a, there are subsets you can define and they can be defined using this axis this operators uh, so there is a whole uh, or such well articulated theory of subsets they give new results of the general kind okay um, so uh, but it is it is not going in the way we are familiar with. so one is forced to learn new things to handle this whole thing i think i will say force some of these ideas are very beautiful so i personally like to learn them sometimes they are difficult but anyway now i want to change the file if you this guy is can i change it yeah. i want to know uh, to show you hello yeah. i want to now pass to what happens with spin half uh, spin tensor is spinorial things something you and i i wrote a simple a simple discussion Uh, called addendum 3 but uh, what i want to talk about that is that uh, when one discusses cpt uh, for spin half particles something new happens this is regardless of my activity with tomita operators something new happens by itself it just it has been known for a while but whose meaning significance was understood i think for the first time by weinberg in his book he noticed that the square of cpt well i should say that the possibility of this kind of phase and void right was known for sure to bigner he discuss, discusses it in istanbul in his lectures on uh, 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 how to represent discrete operations in quantum theory and he finds actually a group pt pt cpt he gets a group with pt which is an eight element group which is very pt you think how many element pt p times t p uh, how many elements can you get he gets an eight element group uh, as a possible extension in quantum theory but uh, one knew at that time already that very few were realized in actual quantum fields one does not know the reason for it okay at that did not know the reason for it at that time later in 68 uh, so uh, uh, weinberg steve weinberg pointed out showed that in quantum field theory you have only limited choices because of causality he showed that for spin tensorial representations where two pi rotation is plus 1 one is forced to choose cpt square what i call cpt is let me call it theta i don't care about c c is sim going for a right call it theta which is an anti linear anti unity operator he proved that theta must square of theta in tensorial representations should be plus 1 and in spinorial representations it has to be minus 1 if one 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 wants to maintain causality whereas the abstract analysis of bigner gave both the possibilities for each of the quantum field theories so causality simply said you can't do it you can only write minus 1 and he proved similar results for time reversal but that 
can be, but that is less important because we know that time reversal square is time reversal is uh, experimentally broken. So, so we can concentrate on theta, the CPT operator, and the square of it is my has to be minus one. Now we would like to understand why this happens in a simple term, and we will see that this immediately impacts on this uh, Tomita Takizaki theory and changes the structure in a, uh, in a non trivial way and gives anti commutative interventions between the fields automatically. So, in somehow, the reverse of what Weinberg was doing. Weinberg assumed causality and said two fields, space like distances, could either commute or anti commute. And for spin half integral, he showed that uh, they should anti commute. And furthermore, uh, if you want the teacher transform of the fields also to anti commute, you're forced to choose theta squared equal to minus one. Okay? So, he proved that. Okay? So, in, in the book, uh, volume one, there's a proof. So that's highly non trivial, and we are somehow going in the reverse way. And this has consequences. For example, uh, we will see later, somebody was asking me about it. You can now define a relative modular operator between particles and antiparticles, and one can even discuss the entropy of the vacuum, uh, the relative of the modular operator for the local algebra of a particle and an antiparticle. It, it should not be zero. I don't know what it will be. But it will not be zero. It will be something. Okay? I, I don't think anybody has discussed this issue. Okay? So, what is the issue here? Okay? So, uh, let me go. Uh, in the, uh, by the way, I. So, to start with this thing. So, the main point here is that if I take a representation of SU2, I mean, I can take the full Lorentz group, but just take a representation of SU2 in the Hilbert space. Here's some U of G. Okay? U of G is a unitary operator on your space of states. And uh, we know about this SU2 representations that the complex conjugate representation is not, is not the same as the original one. Okay? And no basic change will make it real. The two vector matrix representation of SU2 cannot be made real by change of basis. It is complex. Yeah. Yeah. You can do nothing. You change the imaginary part, get rid of the imaginary parts. Yeah. Yeah. So it is. So here it is. Yeah. One, but it is also true yeah, that the, the bar load designation is unitarily equivalent to the original one. That is, I can find a unitary operator, it's actually a charge qualification operator. Or I can write it into the two by two case on which I concentrate as I tau two, and you see that UG bar with I tau two minus I tau two here is again UG. So it is unitarily equivalent to the original one. So this uh, fact is very important, and it is not enjoyed by all representations of spin groups. It happens to be the case for issue two, but I don't know what will happen if you take SO line, spin line. Is the complex conjugate equivalent to the original one? I doubt. It is, I don't, yeah. So, then, huh? it's huge, so. then I think that this will cause trouble in uh, invariance in of the quantum field theory under SO9 one. SO okay. uh, spin 9 one. Okay. I think so. This local next, in which the local algebra is constructed. I think will be spoiled because this we see that this research is intimately employed in can, uh, analyzing the the depth structure of this local algebra for spin half as well as spin zero. Spin zero will be all right, but the moment you put spin half, there will be trouble. Uh, spin half is the spin representation of SO9, there will be, I think, trouble. Uh, I don't know what the trouble is, but it's an interesting issue of the loop. Uh, I also should say that for what to say. That the boundary group, Lorentz group, boundary group acts on this uh, net of local algebra covariantly. So if you act, uh, uh, say, on a uh, on this uh, local net of algebra, you get back the local wedge. One uh, one wedge will one wedge will go to another wedge. Uh, one diamond will go to another diamond, but the whole thing will be invariant. Okay. So it's a covariant net okay, under Lorentz group. 
it's quite important that it is a COVID in it because it is from that that you can hope to recover the nature of space time. So, uh, this net the elements of the net are only indexing sets. So we would like to know what's underlying space time. Can I get it? So, and without this structure, uh, it looks I think there is, at least I see no hope. Uh, but maybe there is some other way. I don't know. Okay. I would say it's very bad if it happens. So let me keep going. So let me see what happens to CPT. Okay. Uh, CPT, I call theta. Okay. So to be neutral about C, I call it CPT, theta. So the, we know what it does, uh, theta does on tensorial representations. Okay. So on a spinorial representation, this theta is going to act on the tensor product of the momentum phase, then something will carry a carrying spin in this case. It will act on something like this. Okay. And the uh, SU2 will act on both the factors. So uh, if I take UG in the canonical way and uh, act with UG on P times M, it is of P by regular rotation. So you take the comma or some R and you shift it to SO3. So this is a little bit of SO3, then it will rotate P. And it acts on the second index by some matrix, say, say two by each confinement. So I take the SU2 representation, uh, two dimensional representation for simplicity and it's like that. So now I want to know what happens. I am assuming it is a massive particle, but the analysis I do can be carried over or also for uh, also for massless the uh, massless spin half particle that is uh, half integral particles. Now, if you ask what happens for infinite spin particles, uh, I don't know. It may go through, but I don't know because. You get the uh, instead of the small g, which is two by two here, you'll get the infinite dimension representation. And then I don't know whether this complex quadrant is equal to the okay. okay. There will be there will be theorems on this, but I don't know. Okay. So it is related to the issue of whether the DC group representations for spin half are unitarily equal to the original one. And I agree with this passive, I can move the rest frame. I am not very worried about the first part. I am worried about the G. That's what, that's what the inference is. Yes. Okay. Now, mass scales. Mass scales. Mass scales. The mass scales, you will get some standard vector with P, say, uh, along the z axis 1 minus 1, you will say. Times some helicity index there, and the rotate the little group will change the phase, it change, act by a phase corresponding to the helicity. And so far as I know, there should be no problem. Okay, so my analysis, but C, CPT will again get twisted for spin half. Okay, I think okay. I have not done the analysis, but I think it can be done quite easily. What is the problem? I, I, let me take transform. A, so PM is a particle state. And I, let me uh, apply the rotation group, UG is a rotation, and let me apply the theta operation on this. Theta is a CPT operation. So the image of this operation is something in the anti particle representation. So this object here is representing a vector corresponding. So the first order electron, the second will be positron. So we would like to this. Electron and the positron to transform under the rotation group in the same way okay, when they both are at rest. Okay. So let me see what happens. So I apply, I, I take this transform state under the energy and apply it. So what happens is this is anti way and you end up getting bar. So you find that the particle the, the, uh, state which I get by applying UG. Uh, on a particle state, uh, which is an anti particle state, does not transform in the same way as the particles. So they, they are transforming through 
you need to have equal in registrations, but they are different. The matrices are different. So the coupling will change and you can deviate from standard quantum field theory completely. You can't uh, it's equivalent in for internal symmetry group by saying that quark and antiquark transform by three and three star. Okay? It is so, but in that case, three star is not even not even equal to three. Here it's slightly better, uh, but still I will not be able to couple these two in any simple way. Okay? So what do I do? I want to find a new theta. So I put the theta hat there to indicate that this will not be my final theta. So what will I do? I so I can write this uh, G bar as a conjugation on G with I tau. That's because of the fact that the two representations are unitarily equivalent. So now I take this U I tau two and uh, ah, one thing you should notice at this. I tell to the charge permutation matrix is actually an SU2 matrix. Yeah. It is a rotation by pi, pi around the second axis. And since tau 2 is pure imaginary, this matrix is actually a real SU2 matrix. Yeah. 2 by 2 matrix of this I tau 2. Tau 2 is a pure imaginary by multiplying it by. So all the entries of I tau 2 are real. It is also a rotation. Yeah. This is important. So I can uh, now do the following. Okay. I see what will happen if I multiply this theta by unit three operator plus one two I tau two. I twist this original theta from tensorial particles by this I tau two. It is coming from spin. Then you can see quite easily the rotation that I tau two is a real matrix. So this theta with theta hat is not doing anything to it. We can go right through. Okay. Uh, complex conjugation won't do anything. So it will go right through, and you can see quite easily that this operator acting on BGPM is equal to uh, yeah. is equal to same u times theta hat, but this the theta with the same rotation matrix. Because I have written this G bar in the original expression by conjugation. And I put one of these I tau 2 on the left hand side to define a new theta, which I call theta here after this product thing there. And when you do the calculation completely, you find that this object here under GT transforms into standard view as the particles. So the anti particles I create by putting this operator CPT on a particle is the same as the uh, thing that we normally do. What we write as A diagram B diagram corresponds to this operator. So, this is important because I want to check what happens now. I want to know what happens if I now square this operator. If I square this operator, what is that the following? Square of exponential is I tau 2. The square of I tau 2. Is minus one. This I tau two is the two by two matrix zero one minus one zero. So if I square it, I get minus one. Instead of getting plus one, I get minus one. So the result is that this theta, the CPT operation we use in quantum field theory, finds to minus one, not to plus one. So the CPT operation has been changed, and the claim which Weinberg proves for local trees is that. You chose plus one, put this, you will violate causality. You will see that you can derive causality incorporated in this. So, uh, this is what I wanted to tell you. Okay. Uh, see file, okay. And I think that this is somewhat surprising. So, I'll do one thing. Okay. I want to elaborate on this next time and show how it leads to spin and stress theorem. But before I do that, how does it affect? Uh, so this theta, the, the original J was had a theta in the J, the original uh, no, delta. No, what is it? Um, the original J, which was multiplying the square root delta, had a theta and a two and a rotation, okay. a pi rotation around the first axis. Okay. 
Now I had changed integer was square was one plus one. Now I made it minus one. So what happens to that Tomita operator? Because I changed the the unitary part of the polar decomposition. What happens to that S? If I just write nicely, but naively the original thing, you will find that it squares to minus one. Okay. With this thing here, because the new CPT operator and uh, CPT operator is squared to minus one, you will find that the Tomita operator squares to minus one. It's not plus one. So what do you do? Uh, is the Tomita theory scaling? How do I correct it? And um, it seems it, it is corrected in the literature, but the the relationship between the geometrical interpretation and the Tomita interpretation is now getting twisted. It is changed. And because of this change, the recovery of the antiparticle representation for the particle representation also changes character and causality conditions also change. This I think is very interesting. And so I will finish by saying that if this the essential equation I have used here is the unitary equivalence of the spin representation of SO4, SO3 one okay, with the original one. Okay. But suppose I take anions. Anions has phase expansional theta. Is the one complex conjugate representation equivalent and two by it is not exponential i theta becomes exponential minus i theta. So what do we do in that case? Tomita operators exist. They don't care. So what happens, what seems to be happening is that the geometrical link which persists in 1 plus 3 or uh, uh, the, the standard rotation group seems to be failing in those cases. What happens for other groups? Uh, we go recklessly to some higher dimension and look whatever. Is this true? Is it a similar result true? I am not sure. I don't think it is. Okay. Then that will affect. The no, he told me SO3. It will be SO2. Right? So the corresponding group will be SO2. So the spin group in two dimensions will be SO2. So spin 2 will be the universal cover of SO2, which is a real line. So the real line has traction that is given. The anions correspond to phase, for example, like that. And the complex conjugate representation is not equivalent to the original one. Simply no, unless it's minus one. So this analysis, this kind of analysis will not work. So what do we do? What appears to be happening is that the connection between co geometrical covariance of the appropriate net, so the group, underlying group acts on this net seems to be failing in those cases. Uh, here, it, the, uh, it acts nicely, uh, but the moment you deviate from it, so you, the spin group does not have nice properties, which appears to be uh, not maintained in the spinorial representations, or in the class of representations, except tensorial one. So I suspect that this has the, uh, this has serious consequences for people doing uh, quantum field theory, especially when they start discussing uh, spinorial things in the picture. For example, pure, what's it called? Uh, the pure spin off formulation for, uh, for uh, strings and so on. What happens there? I don't know. I think it will be very interesting to investigate this. So I think I'll stop here. And next time I will delve more deeply and see where we go. I have had a lot of trouble in getting control over this object. I think I, I understand it better. If I don't understand it, we can discuss it. That's it. Okay. All right. So the lecture is assigned Monday. Monday, Wednesday. Friday, I don't want. Definitely. But any other two days, 
I don't mind. That's why you prefer in the afternoon, right? I am willing to take morning also. It can be accommodated. But Friday, I don't want because people won't come. They, they are undoubtedly going for a beer party or something. They are not coming. So I don't want. I encourage beer parties, but not when I have done lecturing. Hmm? Yeah. Just let me know. So let me just indicate what I'm going. So I will try to cover this how the twist changes the Tomita operators and possibly discuss some actual applications which people can take up. Then in the next lecture, I will go back to part of field theory and show you a sequence of results okay, which come from the local algebras, which are uh, highly surprising for somebody just doing Lagrangian field theory and so on. You don't know that. How if you uh, what can end up like virality causality, uh, how you can prepare local states. Uh, you can programmably quantify. I said there are all states are mixed in this picture. Okay? But if you take W and W prime, there's a way of twisting uh, the W to any expectation value you choose without affecting the expectation value in W prime. The state is still mixed. But you can twist the state on W in such a way that you can prepare it in any way you like by some operation which will not affect W prime. Explicit formulae are available. So that is very, very funny. So, what does it mean? What is the physical implication of this? We will try to explore this kind of issue together. Okay. Stop.